this 17th session of Wisdom for Living initiative started by the Theosophical Society about one and a half years now. One of the purposes of this Wisdom for Living initiative was to create a platform from which those individuals who have found ways to implement the spiritual principles to their work and living belonging to any field of the spectrum of human activity be it business, arts, fitness, ecology, science, spirituality or even anything else so that they can share their holistic and inclusive approach and understanding with more and more people through this platform which is not only desirable but utterly necessary in the contemporary times where the selfish or self-centered way of living has led us to the situation where not only the majority of individuals in humanity but also the planet itself is facing many existential challenges. And this situation has arrived because if we observe all around the world knowledge is worshipped without any regard of its moral or ethical compass. Atomic power was discovered and what was it first used for? To make a bomb. Researches in biology here, you know, reaching to a new heights but at the same time the race for the bioweapons is also continuing among nations. And material profit has become the only benchmark of success. So much so 
that a law has to be made to remind the corporates of their social responsibility. Can we imagine the downfall of sensitivity in humans that something that should have been spontaneous, that when you prosper, you share, had to be implemented through a law. And here comes the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom has a creative, inclusive, and holistic approach to life or any situation in daily life or any problem, while knowledge, devoid of its ethics and morals, leads to a destructive, exclusive, and very individualistic state of life, the consequences of which are all we are all witnessing currently. And Theosophical Society, since its foundation in 1875, has proclaimed loudly the message of non-separateness. The message of interconnectedness of every being. One life manifesting in myriad forms. That is the wisdom that leads to harmony. And therefore, possibly, before all such theosophical gatherings, an invocation that was penned by Dr. Annie Besant in 1923 is chanted, which sums the whole theosophical philosophy up of oneness, of interconnectedness, which I request you all to follow me if you will, you can remain seated, you can close your eyes. And while saying those words, let's pay attention to each and every word. O oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. O oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. O oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May all who feel themselves as one with thee know they are therefore one with every other. Although this light, this life or love may be hidden, but that does not mean that they do not exist. They exist very much everywhere in this universe and those people who get an insight about them, has a little sense about them, they really become wiser. And from then on, the whole life of theirs is transformed. And from that moment on, they try to live in harmony with each and every one, love and compassion for all. And the natural consequence of which is a truly happy life and a truly successful life. And therefore, today, we have one such individual among us who will talk us talk to us on the subject aligning with the spiritual principles for happiness and success and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce mr ram kumar mr ram kumar although many of you may already know him but what you may not know that he has been an instrumental, he has been instrumental in this whole Wisdom for Living initiative. And he is the single person that you will find in all the Wisdom for Living sessions. Why? Because he is in charge of it. And believe me, 
I do not want to be in his position because I can understand how difficult it is to find such persons, so to find such individuals in today's time who are of that approach to meet them, to convince them, to come here and give a talk. So that's a very hard work that uh, Mr. Ram Kumar is doing. But Mr. Ram Kumar did his electrical and electronics engineering from Annamalai University in 1976 to 1981. He worked in two multinational companies from 1981 to 1985 in Mumbai and in Vishakapatnam as junior foreman in the maintenance in the shop floor of a factory and as a project engineer in VSP under GEC company. At Grindwell Norton Company, Ram Kumar was looking after the maintenance of ovens, boilers, hydraulic presses, ACDH plants, forklifts, cleans, and electrical ACDH and instrumentation. So, all in all, basically, the point is a technical person, the engineering person. The man, now something interesting happened while he was working in Mumbai, and that also changed his life to some extent. While he was working in Mumbai in the factory, where there was a workforce of about 600 people, he saw that about six or seven people who were working in a place which was infested by snakes and also who were working near the boiler place uh, or in the hazardous area where some, you know, some uh, dangerous liquids may overflow or something like that. And they were all working without boots without shoes. So what he did out of his own initiative, he bought boots for all those seven workmen and he gave, he gave them. Very good job, I guess, right? But what did he get? He was forced to resign from the company because he went against the management. In doing so, in helping so the people, fellow people, uh, the management took it as that he is going against the management and they, he was asked to resign. So although he had to say goodbye to those 600 people, but by his good deed, the action of love and compassion, he made 600 very good friends. So at that point, when he saw this, when he underwent this experience, the sense of entrepreneurship, the seed of entrepreneurship was sown into him. That why should I work under somebody? I should create my own working environment. And the irony is that after Ram Kumar left that company, the Maharashtra government made it compulsory for all the factories to give shoes to the workmen. So justice after all. Anyway, as a projects engineer at Vishakapatnam Steel Plant, he was in charge of wiring and switchboards for auditorium, hospital, office, and factory. But he was unhappy with his job. He quit the job and he remained jobless for about six months, did not speak much to anyone, thinking, thinking, contemplating, because he wanted to become an entrepreneur. But to do what? In what direction? The silence inside him was deafening and he wanted to become big in the sense to do good in whatever field he chose. And he got the much awaited opening by way of doing, when he was invited to do the first deal, to do a mega test to check the insulation resistance of cables and the switch gears in a lifeboat factory. And his first bill that he got was for 250 rupees. But the impetus got by the silence for about six months and the goal set that were achieved from time to time made him extremely successful. Hard work, discipline, focus, and most importantly, being kind to all and being conscientious to people, products, and profits made him a good entrepreneur in the field of electrical engineering contracts. 
He did the instrumentation test in coordination with IIT and MIT for the first ever enclosed lifeboat that would be manufactured in India. The boat was made by Vadiar Boats, Chennai, and the fire test carried out by burning an enclosed lifeboat with two trucks loads of petrol in the tank of water was successfully done. And Ram Kumar's company was doing the maintenance of all the Bata showrooms in Chennai, then followed the bank computerization and his company did the electrical work for the computers at Indian Bank Mailapur, which was the first branch in India to have an advanced ledger posting machine. Apart from that, computer site preparation, including several branches of several banks, MNCs, insurance companies, universities, was taken by Ram Kumar's company. And it is important to mention at this point that his company was also ISO certified, that was of international standards. He wanted to expand into turnkey interiors by 1995 and they were into turnkey interiors for corporates and a turnkey interior is like you make a contract for everything yet you deliver the finished final product and to name a few of his clients that he did the turnkey interiors was Singapore Airlines, Volkswagen, Chevrolet, Siemens, Amritanjan, Petrofac, Jet Airways, Titan, Adani, Open Hydrocarbons, SRF, and many, many more. Then I think came the year 2010, which while I was reading this, uh, his introduction, I realized that 2010 might have been the most important, one of the most important and life-changing year for him because it was in 2010 that he came in touch with the Theosophical Society after meeting Dr. Radha Bernia, the former uh, late uh, international president of the Theosophical Society, how he became a member and what happened afterwards, he will tell in his own words, I will not go into that. But also in 2010, he became a volunteer in the Ram Krishna Mutt, Chennai. And he did the interiors for the Mutt also of 4,000 square feet bookshop, the 3D theater, book bank, and many more things, their library, and also did the proofreading there. Ram Kumar has written a number of articles on spirituality for Infinity Thoughts, an international magazine which has a readership of over 5 lakhs. He has also written articles for Wake Up India and The Theosophist. His USP is to help, help wherever he can. Although he has retired from commercials in 2010, but his social work continues unabated. During COVID, he provided food to about 300 homeless people and about 100 policemen on beat every day for more than two months. Even during the second wave, he provided food to about 400 people. Ram Kumar's religion, he proudly says, is kindness. Kindness to all and his philosophy of life is to have a win-win situation. And due, maybe that is the reason that during his work days, he wanted his employees to experience air travel, food in five-star hotel, air conditioning in their homes, and even got club membership for a few. And not only did he himself become an entrepreneur, he helped more than 100 individuals to become one. And no wonder that he took up this duty to conduct Wisdom for Living sessions so that many others like him can be given a platform to share their journey with others. But today, it is Mr. Ram Kumar's day to share with us his thoughts and understanding on the subject, aligning with the spiritual principles for happiness and success. Mr. Ram Kumar. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
thank you for all. Uh, thank you to all of you for coming here despite the heat. Thanks a lot. I sincerely thank you for that because I've got a lot of messages saying that it's very hot outside. I'm not coming like that. So in spite of the heat, you are able to come. I'm very thankful, I'm very grateful to you also. And Shikhar, thank you very much for the lovely introduction. You are a real international uh, <laughs> professor. <laughs> you speak so well, my God, terrific. Uh, I thank Mr. Tim Boyd for giving me an opportunity to take care of the Wisdom for Living series of programs, monthly programs. And today, uh, he has given me the permission to go ahead with this topic of aligning with spiritual principles for happiness and success. I'm grateful to Mr. Tim Boyd. He's Mr. Tim Boyd, the current president, the eighth president of the Theosophical Society. Theosophical Society was founded in the year 1875, and uh, everyone, a lot, only eight presidents have been there, and he's the eighth president. I have immense gratitude to Mrs. Radha Banya, through whom I joined the Theosophical Society because of her simplicity, because of our because of our intelligence and because of deep connection and uh, I think one, because of that oneness factor and the reason why I joined this was the factor called universal brotherhood which I saw when I climbed the way up to the for the first time to the first floor to see her in 2010 thanks to Mrs. Radha Banir and I have immense a gratitude to the founders and presidents of the Theosophical Society from 1875 to right now. Uh, the two people on the far left and the immediate right are Alcott, founder and president, and Blavatsky, uh, another founder, followed by uh, seven presidents. And Mr. Tim Boyd is also there, who is the current president. He's the eighth president. Before I go into the topic, I would like to tell you an incident which took place in Albert Einstein's life. Albert Einstein, you all know that he is a German physicist who won the Nobel Prize in the year 1921 for his uh, study of relativity and photoelectric effect. He got a Nobel Prize and he was invited in many places to give a talk. He went by car to so many places in Europe and also in Germany. And his driver, Harry, accompanied him. He was driving and he was sitting in the back. So much so, the Harry was so much, uh, uh, what should I say? He was uh, listening to all the lectures because he was uh, finding it boring to sit in the car. So he was listening to all the lectures so much so that he was able to absorb and grasp whatever Albert Einstein was talking. And once he said, let's swap places. I'll be Einstein for today and you be the driver. He agreed and no one knew because there were no WhatsApp or no, no connections whatsoever. And no one knew who was Einstein, who was Harry. So they switched places and then Harry gave a wonderful talk on uh, photoelectric effect and relativity. And when the question and answer session said, uh, when the question and answer session, session came, someone asked a question he was able to answer. Another one asked another very uh, uh, tricky question. He said, it's so easy that my driver can answer, pointing to Tim. <laughs> so I am, my status is that of a driver only. So just kindly excuse in case I'm going off way or something like that, if I make mistakes, this is the first time I'm talking about this topic, so I'll try to do my best today, okay? Topics for today, how I joined the Theosophical Society, how I met Radha Banir, and my earlier works, how silence helped and all, I think Shikhar has explained enough, I think I don't need to go and revisit the page. And definition of Theosophy, spirituality, goals, success, and happiness, the beginning of human life, Mind, meditation, why we are all suffering, why do we get tired so often, why we are not able to concentrate. What is a holistic life? Success is just not being having, having material comforts like a car or a fridge or a phone or a house or a whatever it is. Whatever I think, it's just not, success is just not in physical comforts or something like that. It has got much to do with so many other things which is not taught in schools or colleges, like your health has not been taught, your uh, wealth has not been taught, and then happiness has not been taught, your mind and configuration of the mind has not been taught, your intellect has not been taught, nothing has been taught, only this botany, zoology, all that stuff, this applied thing has not been taught at all. I think what is a holistic life is something which we'll be talking about. 
and the five rings what I have broken up into as five rings of happiness and success. That is starting with spirituality, it goes to the mind, it goes to the intellect, it goes to your emotions, it goes then finally your world and then to the destiny. I think I've broken it up into five rings of happiness and success which I will come to that later. And then what is a root system and what is a fruit system and an analogy with the human beings. And there will be a small practice session of about two minutes. Uh, we will do a small pra uh, practice on mindfulness and uh, through breath awareness. Then I'll be talking about health, wellness, what is stress hormone and uh, happiness hormone. What is wealth? for security in old age and unexpected circumstances. And then I'll try to tell you stories on faith, conscience, integrity, detachment, compassion, focus, commitment, patience, all in the form of stories. I'll try my best to do, so kindly bear with me. Thanks. How I joined the Theosophical Society? I have been very successful to so much so. I would uh, frankly say that I've been extremely successful in business. And uh, see, you feel so successful that finally you feel like a failure only. It's how much ever you do, somebody is already there and somebody is ahead of you only, definitely. All, all certain done, these material things and all I have seen and I've traveled abroad, I've seen so many things, I've seen everything. All the best things in life, I think I've seen it. But I was not happy inside. Something was not all right. So I was uh, thinking like that and an accident happened in one of my sites and then I decided, uh, I think this is not for me. And that's the time when my brother-in-law had come from Bombay. And then he said he's going to the Theosophical Society. He had come to meet uh, Keshwar Dastur, who was the then treasurer, international treasurer. And uh, so I just tagged along with them. And then he met, he met her, he introduced me also. We were talking and then, uh, then she was uh, asking me what I do and all. I said, uh, I'm looking for an opening in some kind of a social organization like this. And then when she uh, understood my background that I am a maintenance engineer, uh, way back, about 35 years back, then she immediately took me to the president. And the president asked me a few questions, like what I do and what, what is it I'm looking for and all. I said, I'm not at all happy with whatever I'm doing. I'm earning money only. I'm not earning happiness. I'm not satisfied at all with my uh, life. Actually, I told like that. She asked me, what makes you feel so? I said, I missed a lot of things because of speed. I haven't seen my son grow. My son is here. I haven't seen my son grow. I haven't seen my daughter grow. I have missed a lot of things because of speed. So what do you want to do? I said, I would like to serve. I would like to close my business. I would like to serve in an organization like the Theosophical Society. And then she said, are you sure your wife might object, your children might object? No, this is my call. I've earned enough money to take care of my future. I might not be able to buy a Merc or something like that every now and then. But I think I can definitely provide a consistent, whatever status I am in, I think I can maintain that uh, uh, kind of uh, life. I can maintain, sustain that kind of a lifestyle. So she said, uh, fine, then can you become a maintenance engineer here, superintendent engineer here, taking care of the maintenance of old buildings? I said, fantastic. Then she asked me, you can take your time to close. No, 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 I said, I'll join immediately. She asked me when, I said, tomorrow. And the next day I joined the Theosophical Society. Believe me, it, is, it was on September 13th, Monday, I joined the Theosophical Society as the superintendent of maintenance. It took me a long while for me to close my business because when I told this to my people that I'm closing the company, they immediately panicked because I've run the company for more than 25 years. And I was, was an ISO and all that. A lot of people started leaving the company and I had to finish at least two crores of, or more of work to be completed and we were only about five, six people left. Of course, contractors are all outsiders only. Then I didn't know what to do. And then at that point of time, Ramakrishna came into picture. They came through Google only, Google search. They searched my company's name and then they called me and then I went there. I got very friendly with the monks and uh, they told me to do the 3D theater there. I did it and uh, we got into a very good rapport with them. I got into a very good rapport and our company got into a very good rapport with them. Then uh, what happened was I started going 
and uh, to the Ramakrishna Mad every day at 6.30 for RT. Every day for six months I went and I was continuously chanting Gayatri Mantra all the time. Whenever I'm not doing anything, I'm just chanting Gayatri Mantra. Only. That silence again, as uh, Shikar was telling you about that silence, again for another six months, I continued practicing this Gayatri Java all the time, going to Ramakrishna Mad without, without any absent, uh, without being absent even once. I've regularly attended and I even traveled to Belur Mat to listen to the Aarti there in Calcutta twice. So this silence again enabled me to close my business successfully and my brother uh, helped me in, in the last few stages of my business to be closed. I had a service tax audit, I have a sales tax audit, I have an income tax audit and I closed it finally. In, it took me two years time to close the company which I had run for about 25 years and Theosophical Society came into my life and I am very grateful to the masters and to Ramakrishna Mutt lineage of saffron wearing monks. So this is Swami Gautamananda uh, who gave me the actual order for giving, uh, doing the 3D theater and this is the bookshop I did which is there in the center. This bookshop I did which is in Mailapur. I did the 4,000 square feet uh, shoe uh, uh, that is uh, bookshop and which is still there. It's uh, 2,000 square feet there in the ground floor and another 2,000 square feet in the uh, first, uh, first floor. And they have done the ACDH plants also and uh, I was very close with the monks and uh, I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot from people here also. Uh, Olande Ananda was very close to me. Uh, he is still close to me, he sends messages and all, who is a Dutch born Buddhist monk. I learned a lot from them. See, I'll, I'll tell you what, the nature of the self, I think is where I think we will start our uh, session for today. Study of matter is physics, we all know. Study of composition of matter is chemistry. Study of space is astronomy. Study of living organisms is biology. Study of the nature of the self, the spirit, that is called spirituality. Synthesis of religion, science and philosophy is theosophy. Sarvapriyananda of Ramakrishna Mutt, New York, beautifully explained spirituality means when you close your eyes, you should be at peace. When you open your eyes, you should think, whom else I can serve? I think this is it. Because we are made in life, we are the top 10% of the bracket of people who are all doing very well. 90% of the people are not doing well. I think we should help them. We should help them to achieve what we have achieved. I think that is how I see things. I'll def de definition of happiness and success. Success is defined as a progressive realization of a worthy goal. See, I'll just give a broad example of River Ganga. River Ganga, which originates from Gangotri, it has made up its mind to reach the Bay of Bengal. Was the passage easy for it to go to Bay of Bengal? It's, it was not quite easy. There so many rocks, boulders, hills, valleys, hillocks, forests. It crosses finally and then it reaches Bay of Bengal. This, it's, that's a goal for River Ganga actually. And Edmund Hillary and Tenzing, they climbed this 29,024 height feet uh, um, Everest was it easy for them? It was not easy. Uh, you need a plan. First of all, for setting up a goal, you need a plan. First of all, you should know where you're going. It's a, it's a very famous Zen saying, you should know where you're going. You should know your goal. Supposing somebody picks up a 100 rupee lottery ticket and he gets that uh, prize money, is he successful? I don't think. It's not success. You should have a plan and you should execute it according to the timelines, according to your values, according to so many aspects. Only if you do that, goal setting is very important. Goal setting and success, I think, are interrelated, definitely. As far as Edmund Hillary and Tenzing are concerned, they had the determination, motivation, plan, procedure, precautions, willpower, patience, perseverance, focus, discipline, commitment, and hard work. All these things have factored in their capturing this 29,000 feet Everest. 
it was just not like I walked this way, I found Everest. It's not that way. It is not at all that way. Happiness is in the being. Success is in the becoming. Happiness is what you are. Sarchit Ananda. I think that is the very, very fundamental uh, statement. Existence, consciousness, bliss. We are already a happy being, actually. Realization of that is essential, that we are already a happy, we are basically ananda, because of the mind which comes into picture between the self and the world outside, we are so confused and we confuse others also. Success is getting what one wants, happiness is liking what one has. See, I'll tell you a small story. A man was very unhappy. He was having a lot of money. It was, then he took this pile of money in a bag like this and then off he went to the mountains to seek a guru who, so that, that from the guru he can learn what is happiness and all that. He, that, that happiness was eluding him totally. So he found out from many people nobody was able to give uh, the proper definition of happiness. So off he went to the mountain in search of a guru. Uh, one guru was sitting there under a tree with all these uh, plates of hair and uh, uh, ochre cl clothes and all that. He was sitting there under a tree and he was in deep meditation. This guy went there and then he was carrying his bag of money, complete full currencies and all he was having. And then he uh, went there and the ruffle of leaves uh, woke up that uh, man in meditation and he asked, uh, what do you want? He said, I am looking for happiness. What is there in your bag? He said, it's money. You can't, you're not happy with your money? No, no, no. Money is there, but I'm not happy. Then he said, uh, sit down. Close your eyes. Then he closed his eyes. And then when he opened his eyes, that monk was not there. He had taken away the bag and he had run away. <laughs> and then he sees the backside of him. And then he runs behind the monk. And then the monk was... He eats less, not like others. Monks eat less. They uh, uh, take bhiksha and then eat from the food, morsel of food people give. They, eat on, they live on bhiksha. So this fellow ran and ran and ran and ran and ran. This fellow lost track of him. This, and then finally he comes to the same tree. This man, that ochre clothes and that plate of hair, this man was sitting there. This man was confused. And the bag of money was also there. So he asked, what is it you did? I wanted to prove you only one thing. He said, take the bag. Then he took the bag and then put it on his shoulder again. Are you happy? He, said. he asked. He said, I'm extremely happy. Liking what you have is happiness. You can't go, you'll have 25 buildings in your name and 35 cars in your name. You can have so many things but you are always aspiring for something in the world outside that will never ever give you happiness. Happiness is liking what you have. You don't even go to the 25 houses even once in your lifetime. You just put it in your name, that's all. Does it give you happiness? A lot of people amass so much of crores of money, but does it give them happiness? I don't, I don't know. They can, they can be called successful with respect to money, but can it give them any happiness? I don't think it gives a bit. So, Success is getting what one wants. Happiness is liking what one already has. I think we should all be having enormous gratitude with whatever we have, whatever we have been bestowed with, because whatever happens, happens for the good only, and that's all you deserve. You can desire 101 things, but what you deserve is only this much, that bag of money. Success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. Contentment is the foundation of true happiness. Aspiring for more is the basis of success. I'll tell you a small story on that. See, a man and his wife, a man recently married, they were living in a village just below a mountain, which was picturesque, and you can't ask for a better scenery. You can so people here, I think, pay him a lot of money, make my trip and all that, and go to faraway places to experience countryside or be in a place like this. 
they are already in this kind of a place. Paddy fields here, grow of coconut trees here, and the mountain here on the other side, Kerala, this side, uh, the Thinnelveli side, and all. It's an amazing place it is. So these two people, the husband and wife, recently married, they always quarrel with one another. So much so, this man once, one day said, enough of all your things. You go to your mother's place or do whatever you want. I am getting away from here. I don't want to be with you anymore. Saying this, he walked away. And then he off, he went to the mountains, and then he, he, he got lost actually. He went here and there, and then uh, finally he found uh, 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 a temple there, a uh, Perumal temple, the Vishnu temple there. And Vishnu temple was there, and uh, he went there, he was exhausted, and then he uh, prostrated in front of Lord Vishnu's uh, uh, statue there, and then he, was, he cried his heart out that he was so unhappy and that he wants a divorce. Those times were not the times when there was any divorce or something like that. So he just fell and prostrated in front of Lord Vishnu and then he cried his heart out. And when he opened his eyes, lo and behold, Lord Vishnu was there standing in front of him. I heard your problems. I heard your woes. So what do you want? I'll give you three boons. Ask. He said, can I ask one boon now and I'll come back for the other two boons later. This fellow is a crafty fellow, just like our city people only. I think he's also a very crafty fellow. Then he, Vishnu said, okay, go ahead, ask for a boon. He said, when I go back home, my wife should not be there. He should have gone to my mother's place, his, her, her mother's place. Is this all what you want? You can ask for the moon, you can ask for the sun, you can ask for the village, mountain, anything, river, everything I can give you. All you want is a simple thing. Are you sure? He said, I'm very sure. When I go back home, she should not be there. She should have left for mother's place. He said, Tadastu. So be it. He went back home and then found that uh, his wife was packing her bags and then he saw the backside of her. And then she was leaving. Then she uh, saw him and then said, I'm going to my mother's house. Enough is enough. I can't live with you anymore. I'm going back to my mother's place. And now this guy is so happy evening, he goes out to meet his friends. He had a good uh, time with his friends. And then finally what happened was uh, he was feeling a little uncomfortable because the other friends were saying that their wives are f even worse than his wife because they, those wives beat uh, those husbands also, it seems. So comparing this, comparing, it's always a comparison only whether you have, it's all about two lines only in life whether this or that, this or that. Comparison only all the time, it always comparison. So he suddenly feels that uh, he wants his wife back. Off he goes to the mountain, now he knows the route also. He goes to the mountain and then prays for Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu appears and then asks, another boon? Yes, can you uh, give me only one boon now? And another boon I'll reserve it for later, he said. And then Vishnu agreed to that. And then uh, he asked, what do you want? I can give you anything, but don't ask for this silly wife and things like that, please. No, 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 I'll ask you only that wife only. I want my wife back. Is this all what you want? I can give you 101 things. No, 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 I want my wife back. When I go back home, she should, come, she should have come back. And uh, he said, Tatastu, so be it. So he goes home and then sees his wife uh, there in the house and then she makes coffee for him, they embrace one another, and then they were talking about a good old uh, f first few days of uh, marriage. And then this man confided in uh, his wife about the meeting with Lord Vishnu and what is it we should ask for as the third boon. And now this woman starts thinking, can we ask for gold, can we ask for material, can we ask for mountain, village, coconut grove, farm? There are too, too, too many things to be aspired for, but nothing will give them happiness. So what is it we can uh, ask for? He said, I'll find out from the Lord himself. I'll go there. Next day he morning, he had his uh, breakfast, and then off he went to the mountain to see his Lord. There he prays, and then Lord Vishnu appears in front of him for the last time. He said, this is the last one. Better be careful about it. Don't say wife, give and all that. No, no, no. I'll ask one thing. Can I ask you a question before I ask for the boon? This fellow cleverly asked Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu was bewildered. He's a very cunning guy. 
okay, go ahead and ask the question, but you might be disappointed, yeah, he said. So anyway, uh, please ask the question. What is the boon, had you been in my place, you would have asked, and supposing Lord Vishnu was someone else, and you were not Lord Vishnu, what is the boon you would have asked, had you been in my place? Lord Vishnu smiled and said, I would have asked for the boon of contentment. Because finally, everything, whatever material, whatever, irrespective of whatever, etc., etc., whatever you want, you will never, ever feel very happy. Something will be bothering you. Something will uh, not be all right with you. So I would have asked for the bone of contentment. Then can you please give me this? He asked uh, Lord Vishnu. He said, that asked you. So be it. So off he went back, running to the house, and then he saw everything into, in a different picture because his senses had come into life. All the senses, the ears, the eyes, nose, tongue, skin, everything has come into life. And then he saw everything in a different perspective. The streams were looking golden, the sun was looking great, the clouds were there, and so many things. He saw that everything was fantastic. He was, because he was seeing it with the eye of contentment, and this guy was on the top of the world and he reaches home and he meets the most beautiful woman in the world. Somebody is like Aishwarya Rai sitting there and that's his wife. He's so happy seeing Aishwarya Rai, <laughs> that is his wife, sitting there. And then he had the best coffee and then they lived very happily. And then they aspired for most and more. In the sense, they were very happy with whatever they had, but then their age will not permit like me to retire and then call it a day. So what happened was, they said, we will be very happy with the bone of contentment, all very happy, all whatever we have, all that, let's, let it be like this, but we will aspire for most and more. In the sense, we will, uh, we will do farming, we will do this, we will do that, we will buy one acre of land, we will cultivate, and then the story goes like he cultivated two acres, five acres, and became a big guy. He was very happy, contented, and uh, very successful also. It's a story of contentment. It all starts with contentment, that is, liking what you have. I think it's the most important thing. The best way to be happy, according to me, those days when I'm happy, or the days when I help somebody. I got a seat in LKG for one of my friend's uh, grandson or something. That day I was feeling top of the world, seriously. Believe me, even a small act of kindness, something, a college seat, I've got college seats for many people, or uh, anything. I am thrilled on those days when I'm able to touch the hearts or do something. I, my USP, as uh, Shikar was saying this, just connecting the God, dots, I have contacts, I know people who need help. I just connect the dots. I uh, do the bridging work. This is all is my USB. I think that's what I've been doing so far. And this is my key to happiness is helping others. That's it. Most people fail not because of lack of desire, but lack of commitment. There is no commitment at all. People desire a lot of things, but they lack commitment. I'll tell you a small, uh, this thing, and, and, uh, this thing, uh, a narrative about what happened when in 1984, 85, I think, 84 or 85, I don't know. It was a stormy day in Chennai and Andhra Pradesh, and my um, father's friend was running a company called, called Johnson Electrical Tradings. They wanted to give uh, a tender document to Shar, Sriharikota. They had to give, them, and the last time was three o'clock, and he was supposed to have given, but the cyclone took place, and it was a very nasty cyclone. So no bus, no train, nothing was out there on the road, and uh, it was pouring cats and dogs that day. And then uh, I was requested, uh, they asked me if I can go and give it somehow. I said yes, because normally I say yes to everything. So I said yes. I took my scooter, and then parked it in the central station, uh, uh, this thing, shed there. And it was pouring. Somehow I went there. I had this wind sheeter and uh, had a helmet and I somehow went there. My pants were all wet, but I didn't bother. I said, I will deliver it by 3 o'clock at Sri Harikota. 
Sheher Kota is about some 80, 100 odd, or something like that, odd kilometers. And it was very easy to go. Normally, I go by scooter to Sheher Kota and come back. I was doing some works also that later on. But that day, it was a very st strong cyclone. And a lot of towers fell, that water tank and all fell there. And uh, I somehow or other reached by train. I took a train to Gumudi Pundi, then Sulur Pet. I, uh, then from there, I took a lorry. Lorry guy said, no, it won't come at all. But I managed to get in, and I gave him money. I said, somehow or other, it'll reach me to Sulur Pet. I'll give you so much of money. But halfway down the line, the, there was a culvert. And the culvert had broken, and he could not go beyond that because <laughs> You can cross the thing because river was flowing this way. Not river, actually. It was uh, water gushing through this uh, culvert in huge quantity. Gallons and gallons of water was going this side. So uh, he said, I can't travel anymore. This is the last place I can go up to. And then he stopped the lorry abruptly. And it was another eight kilometers at least, definitely. So uh, I didn't know what to do. I had an umbrella, but umbrellas don't help in such uh, 100 plus kilometer speed of uh, wind. So that the uh, uh, water was splashing all over. I just jumped the culvert and then I went to the other side. And then this glory guy was uh, saying that, please don't go, please don't go. I said, I am going there. I had the tender document with me and safely uh, packed in a pop, uh, this thing, polythene cover. And then this umbrella was uh, not of any use at all to me. But again, I started walking. Uh, the lightning was there, thunder was there, I didn't care. So I just started walking and then the time was up. The time was running. It was uh, almost about 1.30, 1.45 like that. Then I started running. I ran eight kilometers and then I was fairly athletic at that point of time, not now. I was fairly athletic. I used to win races and all in school days. I played some cricket also. So that helped me run eight kilometers and then I went there, reached the place and then that fellow asked me, who are you? I said, I'm coming from Johnson Electrical Tradings. What have we come here for? He said, to hand over the tender documents. Why did you come here? Two weeks postponement we have done already. <laughs> so all my effort, <laughs> but anyway, he was very kind enough to give me a bun, biscuit and a cup of strong tea. I had it, again I walked that eight kilometers back and then the lorry was there waiting for me. It was, uh, I think about five, six o'clock or something like that, something like that. And then I caught hold of the lorry and then went to Sulurpet. I came by a Tsunamba lorry, that is lime clad and lorry. I came along with the driver who was sitting there. Lime, totally it was lime, it was a lime uh, carrier. I came in that, came to up to Central Station and then my scooter was parked there. All the time it was raining, pouring and all. And I went and uh, told this man I have delivered it. Because those times were not, I, I didn't, we didn't have a phone. Nor did I think he have a, had a phone, I think. So this is something which I'm very, this was a very spiritual experience for me. Again, a lot of spiritual experiences have happened to me. I think this is another spiritual experience wherein I was all by myself. I was committed to something. As Mahatriya, I think you must be knowing that um, uh, Mahatriya, his name is, when you are committed to a principle of yours, so much so that you are willing to forsake your life for honoring that principle, the sheer uh, commitment of the principle will make you life adapt you than you adapting to life. I think that's what I thought, which I heard later on, which I thought was absolutely true. This commitment is the spine in which all the other parameters and all the other uh, things rest. Commitment, if you, if you don't have commitment, forget it. Anything, even if you go inside as an inner, inner, inner engineering or outer engineering, if you don't have commitment, I think you've lost the whole thing. Commitment is the spine on which everything will rest. I'll talk about the beginning of one's life. See, you see, when, uh, uh, you know, when a man makes love to his woman, six million sperms enter the vagina of the woman, and uh, only one uh, sperm is successful to fertilize the egg produced by the woman. That fertilized uh, thing is called a zygote. That is a single cell thing. It has got two of the sperm and the egg. And this is called a zygote. In three days, it becomes a blastocyst, they say. And then uh, after some time, it becomes more and more and more. It expands like crazy, 
like so many cells it becomes. And finally, we have about 10 trillion cells. And from the, the zygote to a blastocyst, to, a, uh, uh, to an embryo, to a fetus, and finally, we are out in about 270 days of, in, of time in the mother's womb. All along, you might possibly remember that we uh, have been in a state of deep meditation. Until the tomb, I think we will be suffering from, the, from the, uh, life outside to the tomb, we will be suffering. But when we were there in the mother's body, we were in the state of deep meditation because the mind has not been brought into picture. This important statement of the self, the self has been compared to an infinite circle whose, circumfer whose circumference is nowhere, but whose center is everywhere. When we are born in the world outside, after a few days of innocence, the baby starts getting its mind into picture. That's where the problem starts for anyone in the world. The, the child is born in a place due to past vasanas. The, the kind of, the vasanas have to be burnt. Until the vasanas are burnt, you will be born again and again and again and again. That is what our Vedanta says. See, the brain and mind are different. The mind perceives uh, uh, various inputs through your ears, eyes, nose, skin, tongue, etc. And then it perceives the, uh, through the five uh, uh, sense organs. And then, the karme, that is, jnane, it is called jnanendriyas. Karmendriyas are those, that is, speech, hands, legs, anus, and genitals, or the organs of action. So, the mind creates havoc. The, we were there in a state of deep meditation. The mind comes into picture and it wants this, it wants that, it wants this. And mind, the flow of thoughts constitute the mind. The mind thinks about 60,000 thoughts a day. And it is most of the thoughts, 96 of the percent of the thoughts, we will never ever act upon. All the thoughts are useless thoughts and it burns away a lot of our energy. See, Frequencies of brain waves. See, when we are extremely distressed, when we are extremely in a thinking mode, it will be delta waves. It will be uh, uh, gamma waves at top. 30 to 100 hertz. It's very, very high. And normally, for people like us here at the moment, roughly we are in beta waves situation, wherein alertness and concentration in thinking. That is between 12 and 30 hertz. I think we are all, I think, presently, we are all in that beta waves uh, stage. Then comes the alpha, st alpha state, that is alpha waves, which is the most desirable thing, that is between 9 and 12 hertz, 8 and 12 hertz. That is the meditative, uh, the meditative state wherein desirelessness, actionlessness, timelessness, all those things are there in that particular phase, wherein you will feel very, very good and normally, I am silent most of the time. I hear a kind of a soundless sound here in my, my, this thing. When you are there in that alpha stage most of the time, I think you will be feeling a little, uh, what should I say, in that alpha state. And theta waves, that is a phenomenal thing. A deep concentration like Blavatsky or Leadbeater or those people, I think they will be in that theta state where they know what's happening Somewhere else, 1,500 kilometers, there was a shipwreck and then somebody here in the society knew there was a shipwreck happened and a lot of people were uh, drowned and all that. People are able to know, being clairvoyant and all that, I think it's all because of the theta waves where your individual soul is connected to others also, to the world at large also. And delta waves, it's very deep sleep stage and where where uh, restoration of all uh, things happen. See, this is a, a, a simple diagrammatic uh, thing. That is, it shows meditation. Uh, the child in the womb is meditating. Buddha is meditating. And this young woman is also meditating. Buddha meditates not by focusing here. He focuses here, normally. This is called the solar plexus and he focuses here. They are in a state of meditation. 
why do we get tired so often for no valid reason? It is mostly not because of physical work. Physical work will never tire you. I ran that 16 kilometers. I was not tired that day. I was not tired. Mentally only, people get tired. Thinking, 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 thinking. Thinking makes one tired, really. It is unnecessary thoughts. As I told you, we think about 60,000 thoughts a day. If we can reduce the thoughts by thinking the same thought continuously, then it's all right. Or if you are doing some work with a lot of attention, you are in a mindful state. Whatever you do, you are in a mindful state. If you are in a mindful state, whatever you do is okay. But if you are mindless, if you are sleepwalking through life, I think it's not okay. I think that is when you exhaust a lot of energy by unnecessary stupid thoughts. <coughs> yeah, on an average, the mind thinks about 60,000 thoughts a day. Almost 96% of the thoughts, we don't do anything about it. We think repetitively the same thoughts. This causes a wasteful of wastefulness of energy. If we can practice mindfulness, mindful of whatever we are doing, if I am talking and I am thinking about what I should have for dinner, it's not okay. It's not cool. So I should be thinking about what will be my next slide and what should I do and all that. So I think that is mindfulness. Doing it mindfully, whatever you do mindfully is called mindfulness. That's a small practice which we can do a little, a few minutes later. I think that will set a beautiful thing whenever, because most of the time when um, uh, we get emotional, we get angry, we are envious, we are jealous, we are blah, blah, blah. There are so many things, there are so many negative emotions and there are as many positive emotions also. So when this negative emotion happens, if we do mindfulness of just watching our breath, watching our feelings, watching our breath, most of the, that is the, that is called vipassana. I'll come to that later. I think that can restore you back to that all clear put on the calculator. In calculator, you put all clear, it will be cleared. So that way it becomes to that kind of a state. And we can uh, come to the present state. See, think uh, this is a YouTube. Uh, you must have seen in the physics laboratory. When you put water here, the water rises uniformly on both the sides. When the energy level goes up, you, uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, go from the physical personality to a mental personality, to an intellectual personality, to an emotional personality, and to spiritual personality. Instead of, I'll just read it out, I think. What is spiritual evolution? Sometimes we see people succeeding in lives. It appears that there is no logic to success. I have seen very, very capable people, highly educated people with a lot of advantage, not succeeding. And also we see people, these people can't talk properly and their extraordinary success startles you. Take Gandhi for that example, or Mother Teresa for that example. They can't talk, they can't talk very well. But it seems there is no logic it seems that everything that is happening in life is random. However, there is an order to this randomness. There is an order to this chaos. There is an existential hierarchy which supersedes all man-made hierarchies. And there is a spiritual dimension to energy. Material is form. Spiritual is formless. Spiritual can neither be defined or confined. There is a formless presence in all of us in all the functions in which everything functions, but how to make it function is spiritual evolution. Spiritual evolution is not wearing a color of clothes, not because you know a few slokas, not because uh, he has been given a position in the temple, not because he's wearing some symbols of religion. Spiritual evolution is even if you are a monkey, you should know how to make it work for you. That is spiritual evolution. Nothing can be closer to truth than this. Spiritual evolution is to delegate it to the creator, that is the God, and get it done. The laws of spiritual energy that govern our life are, the lower in energy would be drawn towards the higher in energy, and the higher in energy would always empower the lower in energy. When you align to this law, 
material evolution is not at all a problem. It's very simple. This is how it rises, the YouTube it rises from physical to mental. When your energy level is increased, you will be always pushed higher and deeper. This is spiritual evolution. Without the second law, spiritual evolution is not possible even if you learn Shastras, do a PhD in Jainology, or go to seminary schools and learn, or to do Namas five times, do fasting, etc., it might not help. As you draw more energy, you will be drawing all the lower in energy. People come in search of you, not in political perspective. From a corporate setup itself, good people should come and work for you. Opportunities come in search of you. Investments come in search of you. Your responsibility will be to grow, will be to, will be to grow higher in energy. I'll start drawing the best in my life. That's why it is very confusing seeing the results various people produce. In the intangible existential hierarchy, all those who are lower in energy will be drawn by the higher in energy. Gandhi had a feminine voice. He was not a great communicator, yet he he was a very powerful person. Almost looks like the contract will come to us, but it doesn't. The person confided that he would join, but he did not join. Just increase the energy level. All the rivers will come to the ocean. A gesture is enough to empower people. Everything in this materialistic level will change to your advantage. When the energy level is increased, you are pushed higher and deeper. Consider the YouTube. Water finds its own level. When you fill up water on one side, the other side is also filled up to the same level. Make markings on one side, indicating the level of water, and on the other side, indicate mental, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. As the water rises in one side, it increases on the other side also. These are all the personalities, physical, mental, intellectual personalities. Physical personality. Although you have a human form, you still operate by instincts and not by intelligence. The very raw stage people are there in this level. None of us are here in this level, fortunately. Mental personality. When the energy level rises, this is the stage of indulgence and repetitiveness of the experience. Habits control your life. Many of us will be in this level, in this mental level only. You will see the same movie two times. You will see the same Adivelu joke seven times. The repetitiveness of the experience, that is, you will be in this mental state of uh, personality. When the energy levels increase, you will be identified with the intellectual personality. Versatility, varied experiences, and this shift makes it easy for to choose between what is right and what is easy. Right over wrong, when you come to this intellectual personality, will become very easy. From the intelligent personality to the emotional personality or feeling personality, you start feeling beautiful within. Love is no more a choice. Rose does not decide to give its fragrance. Spreading its fra fragrance becomes its nature. When the energy level increases further at the spiritual level, the river has merged into the ocean and becomes the ocean. The duality is removed. The du me and my father are one and the same, as Christ used to say. There is no cosmic divide in this phenomenon anymore. Perennial flow happens. When you reach that stage, it is not the energy flow to you. You become the energy source for others. So these are all things which will happen only if you start being in a uh, meditative state. This is it, nothing else. This physical personality, mental personality, all these personalities will start increasing when you become still be, be still and know that I am your God, said Jesus. I think that's a very, very important statement. I think this is it. You be in a state of concentration first, dharana, samadhi, and all those things happen. Dhyana, dharana, and uh, samadhi happens. You go into this dhyana stage. I brought a, a tratak for concentration. You just show me that. that one. Now, first, I think the easiest thing what one can do is concentration. That's very important. From dhyana, that is concentration, one can go in deeper into dharana, contemplation. I will, I'm going to meditate. No, meditate. no, it doesn't happen that way. 
I think first of all you should know how to concentrate. Ange vesu. Just keep it there. That's okay. Some somewhere just So if you see this flame, this is a simple candle flame, you know, no big deal at all. It is just a stand made uh, by somebody who is marketing this item. It's called a tratak. It is no if you see this light, this flicker of light, you see the inside of that. If you just see it long enough, I think you'll start and then if you close your eyes, you'll have a picture of the flame there inside your uh, eyes for a few seconds and you can increase the uh, se number of seconds you are able to hold on to the image when you close your eyes. By seeing it for about say one minute or something, you close your eyes, you can visualize it for at least 15-20 seconds if you are, and then this has to increase actually. And then this is the first stage of reaching this personalities and all, I think the first stage I think is to be aware and then start from the physical, mental, etc, etc to dharana, contemplation. Contemplation is on what? Meditation on what? That's very important. I'm doing meditation. So what does it mean? Closing your eyes, you'll be thinking 101 things like what is uh, for today's uh, lunch and what is the IPL uh, score and uh, who is playing who against who. All those 101 things will be uh, going on rapidly in your mind. No, no, that is not that. Unless you concentrate, just like it's like pole vault, you, you just go like uh, Sarge Bupka, no? He just goes along with the pole to, uh, to jump the wall from the, uh, to the other side. He takes the pole and runs and then once you go there, you leave the pole and then you jump into the other side into that uh, bed kind of a thing. So you reach that stage that meditation is a noun. Meditation is a noun. The people say, I'm doing meditation. You can't, you can't do meditation. How is it you can say, I, I'll do meditation? I'm going to do meditation. Meditation is a noun. You can't, you can meditate. You can't do meditation. Meditation is a noun. You can do contemplation. Contemplation on what? Contemplation on the higher, higher self. You need, you need to reach the higher up. You need to reach the higher up. Just closing your eyes, it, nothing will happen. Unless you focus on something between your eyebrows or your solar plexus, Vivek, Swami Vivekananda used to sit like this in a stage like this and he used to be concentrating on the solar plexus here. I think that it is going up is what meditation is all about. Talk, thinking about the self all the time, thinking that is the best thing, this tapas, penance, all those things are all fundamental things what we do. I think these are all fundamentals. What we do, this yama, niyamas, all those things are all fine. But finally, finally, Yoga Sutras of uh, Patanjali says that the final thing is samadhi. That is the oneness. This oneness is what Theosophical Society teaches. It's a beautiful point. I think this oneness is all what we are trying to reach. And if we reach this oneness, we will never be born again in the cycle of births and deaths. That is the most important thing. So... How to increase energy levels? It's a very important point. Thinkers and philosophers tell you to remove negative emotions. Negative emotion is a huge drain of energy. In business, not only sales is important, but controlling expenses is also very important. Anger is another negative emotion. Through anger, you consume a lot of energy. Dwelling too much in the past, also you consume a lot of negative energy. Living in guilt, hate, jealousy, comparison, being judgmental, gossiping about others. Gossiping is the number one killer. It consumes enormous energy. Uh, in Jay Krishnamurthy's, uh, in the title, Alcyon's, uh, at the feet of the master, he talks about love. He talks about uh, four aspects, uh, desirelessness, detachment, um, and uh, love, and then uh, wisdom. In love, he says, this superstition and gossiping, they are real crime. Gossiping takes tons and tons of energy. Oh, what did you do? What did, what did he say? And all that. Gossiping is the number one killer and it's a huge time stealer and energy stealer. Stress, anger, confusion, jealousy, lust, resentment, all those things are all negative things. When you think positive, when you dance, you will not feel exhausted at all. But when you start thinking about something, lust or hate or resentment or envy or jealousy or something like that, you will start getting tired. And if you start gossiping, you will get all the more tired and zapped up. 
to live every moment in life is to live every moment intensely, that is mindfulness. There must be life, enthusiasm, you should cherish life. Our grandfather used to go in a bullock cart with a whistle in his throat, like that he used to whistle. Now we go in a Mercedes Benz like this. How does it look? We are not cheerful at all. We have lost our happiness. We have lost, we don't know what we are, where we are going. We have lost everything in the last so many years. Last, I think, I think only about three or four decades. We have lost contentment, happiness. We don't know where we are going. We just want to acquire this. Acquire this property. Acquire this car. Acquirement, lust, all those things have been the ruining factor for all. To live is to, to live is to live enthusiastically. Enthusiasm converts all actions into right actions. If energy is getting depleted by doing an action, it's not the right action. The closer you wake up to sunrise, more is your energy. Rise along with the sun is another point. All this is taking water in a mug from the river and filling up your well. There is one way you can dig a canal from the river to your well, and that is through meditation. That is the way. That is the best way. The crux of today's talk for me, I think, is do meditation. Connect yourself to higher up and you will be reaching far and high and climbing and then reaching for the stars. When in meditation, cosmic energy, divine energy gets transferred only at the time of non-doing. That is, you go to Shiva temple and all. What they say, sit there for a few seconds. Sit there for a few seconds and not eat uh, kadalai or uh, peanuts and things like that. No, 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 it's not that. Sit down, close your eyes for a few seconds. At that time, that being higher in vibrations, that higher in energy will be transferred to the lower in energy that is you. It will be transferred only in a state of non-doing. When you are not doing anything, any activity, you are still, you are just breathing, that's it. And in that stage, energy is transferred, and that is through meditation only. Even going to Shiva temple, I think that is what I think people say. Sit, when you leave out, you do the darshan and all, when you come out, sit for a few, few seconds, few minutes, and then do nothing. At that time, that spiritual energy will be passed on to you. Even chanting Om and all, no? like you say Om, you leave a gap. And then say Om, continue with that Om. You leave a gap between those two. That gap is where I think the spiritual energy flows into you. Even you say Azan, no? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You just say, I don't want to do that. But the gap between two consecutive syllables of that sound mantra, by chanting Om or Gayatri Mantra or Azan or uh, hail Jesus or whatever, I think that gap has got to be there. So in the gap, the spirit, spiritual energy flows into your being and the personalities are raised. And finally, the end goal is to be spiritual by nature. Spiritual personality is what I think one should aspire for. See, what are the advantages of meditation? See, the final goal of all goals is to not is not to be born again. I think that is the final goal. I'll come to that later. But advantages of meditation are it reduces stress, controls anxiety, promotes emotional health, enhances self-awareness, increases attention span, reduces age-related memory loss, can generate kindness, may help fight addictions, improve sleep, helps control pain, decreases blood pressure, reduces blood glucose levels. Living a holistic life is in every day, in every day, I'll be healthy, wealthy, successful, blissful, loving and enlightened. I think this is a holistic life. Not by saying that my life, my right side biceps is very strong, like that it doesn't work. Left side also has got to be strong and that has to be supported by two feet. Everything has got to be there. So a holistic life means that you need to be healthy, you need to be happy, blissful, you need to be successful, you need to be loving, you need to be enlightened. So this is a holistic life. The, I, I was telling about the five rings of happiness. It starts with spirituality, it goes to the mind, it goes to the relationships. Relationships are the most important thing. Relationships, 
that is the most important aspect of uh, life in this uh, planet. Interrelationship and interrelationships, both. And then interaction with the world, and then finally the destiny. Spirituality is where our life begins, where we need to commence our work. Mind comes after we are born, as I told you. Then relationships, then interactions with the world, and then your destiny will happen. Did you know that a tree grows in two directions at the same time? Did you know? See, you can see a portion of the root taking place inside the soil. When a seed is sown in the soil, a part of it grows, starts growing downward first. The spirituality also starts growing from inside, deep within, first of all. It grows inside. The spiritual, that is spirituality. That is, it starts from deep within. Nothing is, you, you don't see the fruit straight away. There are roots and then shoots and then finally branches, tree, a trunk, branches, flowers, fruits, etc. First of all, roots. The roots, are, this area above the ground is called the physical world. The area which is below the ground is called metaphysical world. In this sea, you can see the mangoes here. You can see the end result. Mangoes here, the sunflower there in the middle. And you can see the roots going down on the seedlings. See, there are the nature of the tree is, it is both, it has, the nature of a tree is both phototropic and gravitropic. It has got two natures. One, this gravitropic means it is going towards that is, along with the gravity, it goes along to the dirt and dust and all that. And uh, it is in the metaphysical world. See, what I mean to say is, you can see that the roots are all down. What you see there is the apples, what you see is the sunflower, what you see are all the entrails. But how much of work has gone into a Sachin Tendulkar or a Bill Gates? or Elon Musk or someone, or Dhirubhai Ambani, how much of work they would have done to become the person they are now at the moment? Dhirubhai Ambani, of course, is no more, but other, uh, his, uh, his son. Amazing. They, they, <clears throat> they would have worked with enormous focus, hard work, commitment, discipline, enthusiasm, and would have taken care of their health, and then having gratitude, kindness, compassion, contentment, energy levels, love, integrity, faith, and all that to become both happy and successful. I think success and happiness are byproducts of all these things that are down below. We see only the, we see, we see only the uh, fruits, but the roots are most important. If you see, if what you do during, what you do after office hours determines how you do during office hours is a famous saying. This is what I strongly believe in. What you do after office hours, you go and do your homework, you introspect, you do all sorts of things. And that is very important. Uh, when I did business, I used to think like that. So the same thing is when you have all the, when your root systems are in fact, are intact, I think your upper side, that is what other people see and your success or your happiness or your other things, what other people see, they will be obviously evident. So work on the root system, meditate, do all the things that has been written here, have faith, all those things, I think the, those things are all very important to have a very good life. The root system is as important as the, um, uh, as the shoot system, uh, or the fruit system, I would say. See, this is spirituality at its best. I have uh, drawn five, uh, six trees here, but all the plants or trees or birds or animals or fish or human beings, they are all driven by the same spiritual energy only. I have not drawn a plant or a tree or a bird like that. I have just indicated by means of six trees only having roots. Everything, see, I am a human, I am a spiritual being living a human life. Simple. I am a spiritual being living a human life. The tree, that's also a spiritual being living a tree life. Same thing with birds or fish or whatever. 
animals they are all we are all spiritual beings living certain other lives i think this talks about oneness see anything that has got life has a spiritual component and all of us are living in a interconnected world spirituality is one life forms are many electricity is one but the electricity is operating this amplifier electricity is operating this air conditioner and then it is operating my computer it is operating uh, there are so many things lights fans everything this projector every, everything so electricity is one the applications are many similarly cars are one sorry gas is one but automobiles are many japanese cars are there chinese cars are there the gas is one spirituality is one same way electricity is one the forms are many the applications are many so this is a very important thing one needs to remember that is we are all spiritual beings having a different life a human life or a plant life or a tree life or a fish life or a whatever 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 so this figure depicts i am not drawn a plant or a tree or a bird but this is what i think is i am trying to say the best perspective as a summary of what i have said is uh, success is in the big things happiness is in the small things we are very happy when i just go out in my scooter and then have a 11 rupees tea i a drink this is the most happiest thing all by myself i go not by this muck and uh, go there or oh, like, like that no 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 happiness is in the small things you go by simple all costless luxuries are the things that i think make oh my god i have not even covered half we'll have another session then success is in the big things <laughs> happiness is in the small things meditation is in nothing and god is in everything i'll just sum it up in just only one uh, this thing and then i'll leave it because i have wanted to tell a lot of stories i think time has run out i think anyway this is what i think we should pay heed to god give me the serenity to accept the things that i cannot change i was telling my sister that day this prayer only courage to change the things that i can change and the wisdom to know the difference this is very important this is the final crux of all things you can live a very very happy life if you know this and i would add by saying that change the changeable accept the unchangeable and remove yourself from the unacceptable you should remove yourself supposing you don't accept what you are not able to change that person because the only person you can change is yourself only you can't change the other people and all can you change your spouse it's not possible very different very difficult to change your spouse so change the changeable accept the unchangeable and remove yourself from the unacceptable because some people live a value less based life i think we should ignore and we should remove from those things that are not for us we should remove ourselves from that i think that's a very important thing and i would uh, close here with only about uh, 25 slides have gone i've got another uh, 20 27 left <laughs> we'll continue it perhaps in the next month <laughs> we need we need time to assimilate also <laughs> So thank you very much once again for uh, coming here and uh, <laughs> uh, just uh, one minute yeah all you have any questions you can ask maybe yeah, exactly if somebody has any questions we cannot take more questions because we are already running out of time so two three questions the first ones but please use the mic to ask the question you can raise your hand and we can bring you the mic but ah okay See, I am the driver. Okay. Okay. I am Einstein. I am not the Einstein. Yeah. <laughs> Einstein is this guy. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. So, in case I am not able to answer, no, 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 pass no, the no. mic to him. No. Uh, see, you are a uh, very experienced man, obviously. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, what are the simple practices. Yeah. Okay. Only one thing, sir. I'll That's tell all. and finish it off. Okay. This vipassana meditation. It's not big uh, rocket science. It's so simple. you will not breathe as i say you will not uh, uh, that is observe, that is i would say that you just observe your breathing sit here with your eyes closed not no 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 i'm just saying sit here with your eyes closed with your feet 
firmly on the ground. With your feet firmly on the ground. And then you can, you have to keep your hands like this, upward facing position. And then just observe your breathing. You don't breathe and all, just all, like pranayama and all, I'm not telling you all that. Just observe your breathing, the warm air going through your nostrils and uh, the another uh, slightly more warmer air going out of the nostrils. Either observe this at this level or this uh, stomach expanding uh, out like a balloon or coming inside like that. You observe either this or this. Either the air which is going through and then inflating this balloon kind of the stomach here or else you observe here. Either one of the two. I think you observe only one, only one. You don't observe both at the same time. You observe only one and then that will in immediately within one or two minutes if you have an emotional problem, if you have an anger or some kind of somebody has passed some wrong remarks about you or something like that. This really helps. I have found it many times. That is, you move out of the situation. You move out of the situation and do this practice for one or two minutes. Or you can do it in office, you can do it at home, you can do it anywhere. You can do it in your car also, but not when you're driving. So, uh, you, <laughs> you can do this and then immediately there will be relief. You just observe because you are mindful of doing it. You become mindful. This is mindfulness. Mindfulness through breath awareness. This is what I'm trying to say. So you become mindful of anything. That's why I do is I stick a bindi. Uh, people wear this bindi on your uh, forehead. No, women wear it on the forehead. I just keep it there. One sticker there, and another sticker there. I just when I walk like this, I just see this uh, red color thing. I don't know where I get this. I just keep walking like this. This bindi is here. And another one that I walk, they're seeing that also. So that way, I improve my concentration. And whatever I had in my mind, somebody hurt me or somebody passed some bad remarks on me or something like that, will totally get away. And then you come back. That is, your, again, you are um, uh, mentally aware. That is, mindfully aware what you're doing. That is, you have this bindi there. I just brought an example there just to show one bindi here, one big one. Just like what Usha Utup has, no? That kind of a thing. <laughs> so I, I had it in my bag somewhere. I'm, I'm unable to trace it. So one there and another one here. Just walk like this five times. Your mood will change. This is what I have been doing. This is what I have been doing. Mindful awareness. Whatever you are doing, do it mindfully. As uh, See, supposing I, have, I know Sri Sri Ravi Shankar used to say, that whenever he takes food, nobody will come anywhere near him because he enjoys the food. Gaur Gopal Das has told in one of his videos that he enjoys his taking bath also so much because mindful, everything is doing mindfully. Eating, Ravi Shankar does mindfully. Taking bath, he does it mindfully. Do everything mindfully and you will not have any issues at all. Mind, see, what happens is our mind goes somewhere else. I am here and I am thinking about food there in the night. Same thing only happens. You are sleepwalking in life. That is the other sentence for saying that with an inward commas. That is sleepwalking in life. Stop doing that. I think you will be happy. Mindfulness awareness. Mindful awareness of your breath or observing this uh, light or observing the bindi walking here and there. That gives enormous concentration and your thing immediately shifts position. Anyone else? No, I think uh, our today's uh, speaker, Mr. Ram Kumar, has explained things in so much detail and simple language that I don't think there would be any doubts about what are the secrets of the truly successful and truly happy life. And whatever part is remaining, we can... Uh, next, take it uh, next time and on behalf of everyone on behalf of Theosophical Society all our delegates who are present on my personal behalf and on his behalf also 
because he is the in charge of wisdom for living initiative i extend a heartfelt gratitude to mr ram kumar for uh, giving us such a wonderful uh, presentation on the secret of happy life and successful life and i request our international secretary mr maria arthama to give these books as a token of our gratitude these are the three gems of the theosophical literature the theosophic life and vivek chunamani thank you